Hey guys, please excuse my disheveled appearance. I've just been tearing some more drywall out of the basement. You will be getting an update on the basement situation soon, but that's not what this video is going to be about. This video is going to be about this little TV right next to me. That is the Mac XB702. I wasn't planning on doing a restoration video on it so soon, but it sparked a lot of interest. So let's, let's give it a shot. Now it's definitely going to be in two separate series. This one is going to be about the electronics. We're going to try to get it running. We're going to try to get a picture on the screen. The cabinet, if you recall from my introduction video on this set, it needs a lot of help. It needs to be completely re-veneered and refinished and get some reproduction decals and so on. I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, I don't have a good area to do that yet. But that should be an interesting project. I've done some selective re-veneering, like just maybe the top of a cabinet, but never an entire cabinet before. All right, so if you haven't seen the introduction video, I think I called it the Mac XB702 Unveiled, I suggest you go and watch that. I don't want to rehash all the same info again. Uh, just briefly, I got this set um, spring of 2021, I think. Um, and... I haven't done anything with it since. It's a lesser known brand, Mac, uh, Mac Industries or something like that. I believe the guy's name is John Mac. Uh, he's based in the Midwest and basically only sold in the Midwest. The cabinets uh, is definitely uh, is on the uh, budget side. The chassis is fairly simple too, but Mac didn't make it. The same chassis is used in a Teletone, a Firestone, and possibly several others. I don't know who made it. Maybe Warwick. There were a number of companies that um, didn't sell TVs or radios themselves. They made chassis. For example, if you recall, um, some years ago I restored a beautiful blonde 16-inch Sentinel TV made in Evanston, Illinois. And then um, around the same time I I got a Westinghouse TV, no, sorry, a Ward's Airline TV. Had exactly the same chassis in it. Um, so, I uh, do happen to have that Firestone. If you recall, I got that on the 4th of July, I think in 2020. Um, so it'll be interesting when I get around to that one, which also has um, needs a lot of cabinet work, uh, to see how similar they are. The one thing that is different and unique, Mac did put their own tuner in this and they altered the power supply to accommodate it. But otherwise it seems like the electronics are the same. Which is good in a way. So it's rare in terms of the cabinet and the name on it, but uh, there's plenty of service info. It's in Riders, Sam's, and probably several other publications. So we should be solid on that front. Um, so let us pop this out. It's in all original condition inside. I don't think it's ever been worked on. I'm tempted to try a controlled power-up. Kind of been doing that lately. Um, makes, things, makes things more interesting. But I will warn you, there is a selenium rectifier in here. I have had one go up in my face, so to speak. Not literally in my face, but nearby. It smells really bad. And it takes a while to get the stench out. Not, so that's the only reason, that's the main reason I'm a little bit wary of doing it, but someday I would like to capture that on a phone, on film for all of you folks so you could see <laughs> what can happen. I should probably rig up a demo out in the garage and just intentionally overload a selenium rectifier just as a cautionary tale for you all. But uh, anyways, let us proceed. I'm going to pop the knobs off and pull the chassis out, refresh my memory of what's going on, do a quick inspection of the electronics. If I don't see anything that really is worrisome, let's try a controlled power-up. I've got the chassis pulled out. The original power cord is in good condition, so I have it plugged right in to my Syncor Pier 57. I've got the output voltage turned down a bit. 
and we're gonna try firing this up. Now, a couple things. One, um, when I first explored this, I did take out one of the caps. I think this is one of the vertical deflection caps. So assuming the set turns on and we get a raster, it's not going to fully deflect vertically. If, you know, if we're lucky and the caps are good enough, we'll get like half a screen deflection. Two, uh, we're going to do a slow power-up. If you watch my Motorola 9T1, um, I try, attempted to reform the caps and I had some success. That's what we're going to try doing with this too. So we're not going to go with full voltage yet. So let's see, the set is off. PR57 on. Let's go with, oh, I don't know, let's start with like 30 volts. Switch to current mode. And here we go. It's running current. Excellent. And not an excessive amount of current. Got to crack a lot of the speaker. And the current draw is dropping, which is good. Tube filament's cold, try more current, they warm up, the current should drop off. However, as the rectifier tubes warm up, it just starts to run more current. There's a very bizarre power supply, I went over that in the introduction of the video. We'll be looking at it again real soon. There is a selenium rectifier, but there are also two rectifier tubes. Strange power supply, to put it mildly. Right, what's this? Increase the current. See, can we even see the tubes glowing yet? Yes. It's a feeble glow. I'm seeing it out of the 6X5 and the CRT. Series strong set, but there are two strings. They're both 300 milliamps, but there are two tubes that run on 600 milliamps. The CRT and a 6x5 rectifier. Those two I can see glowing. I'm going to have the lights off anyways. Let's see what voltage are we at now. Boy, my eyesight is shot. 50 volts. So what am I doing? What am I trying to accomplish? We have three big old electrolytic caps up here. With age, the stuff inside those cans, I'll put this in layman's terms, the stuff inside those cans deteriorates. Think of it like a rechargeable battery that's been sitting around on the shelf for a long, long time. You have to kind of recondition them if you hope to get any life out of them. They're not going to be as good as new, even just sitting around and use these kind of um, lose their effectiveness. But the idea is if you slowly, maybe even over the course of an hour or two, increase the voltage on them, it gives it a chance for the chemicals inside to kind of reconstitute. It's not quite right, but <laughs> it's, it's a good enough analogy, I think. Now, if they can't, there's two possibilities. One, they're dried out, and it's just effectively going to be like it, they're not even there. They're not going to absorb any energy. They're just not going to do anything. The other possibility is they've developed internal leakage and they're going to start getting warm. If they get warm enough and there's still enough liquid or not really liquid, but dampness inside, they can vent. Uh, these caps typically have like a rubber plug somewhere under them. And if they get too hot inside, it'll burst out and you get a splooge of stuff coming out. Some caps don't have that, and they just blow <laughs> wherever the weakest point is. Somewhere is some seam on the... These are, there's an aluminum can underneath that cardboard cover, and the aluminum can will burst open somewhere. But I would hope we would see some warning signs. That's why I'm keeping my eye on this current the entire time. If the current would start shooting up, or we'd start seeing a little curl of smoke, or I'd smell something. Powered up, it should probably draw around an amp, amp and a quarter, I'm guesstimating. But 
the high voltage is created inside of this box. It's um, an RF oscillator step up transformer. Running off of I don't know, 12SN7 or something like that. And I'm a feedback oscillator, sort of like a mini Tesla coil. So we need that to kick in if we have any hope of seeing something on this. But there's a pretty good chance that'll kind of work because that's kind of just independent of everything else. But with the lights on, I cannot see any two filaments glowing at all. Oh, now I can. It takes my eyes a little while to do adjust. Yeah, I can see both rectifier tubes are glowing and one of these up front. It's real faint orange. I actually don't see the CRT fill. Well, okay, yeah, it is. Boy. CRT is kind of dirty, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I can see the filament glow. Well, things seem awfully stable. I mean, when I, every time I go up, the current just kind of goes up and stays right there. Now, given this has had the inte an, an intact power cord, it's entirely possible this set has been powered up a number of times in recent, recent years. I don't know. I just know it hasn't been recapped. All right, I'm getting to the point now where I can kind of see film and glow with the lights on. Certainly on this guy, it's a 25L6 beam power tube up front here. That one I can definitely see glowing. Let's see, I've got a cheat sheet for the control somewhere around here. Let's see, let's make sure i got the volume turned up. Oh yeah, we got, we got uh, noise coming out of the speaker. Oof, that is a stiff channel tuner. We happen to have, we no longer have an analog broadcast on channel 6, we used to. But we do have an FM radio station, which is pretty much on the same frequency as the old VHF channel 6. If this was fully powered up and working, we should be able to hear some music come out. We are up to... Uh, 75 volts, so more than halfway there. We're going to go up to 90. I would expect if, if it's going to come to life at all around 100 volts or so, maybe we'd see a raster or some kind of glowing. Let's see, let's get the brightness. Brightness is on the front. That's a little unusual. So it's this guy, I'm guessing. Um, I'm used to Motorola sets and the brightness is always on the back, right next to the power cord. <laughs> Not the greatest place to put it. So we're hearing a, a ticking or a motorboating sound coming out of the speaker. It's not changing with the volume control. There's also no crash as I change channels. No, we're not hearing any static. Current draw. Pretty modest. 0.7 amps. Let's keep going. It's a 105 now. All the tubes are glowing. I don't want to change channels. You know, you don't always get lucky. Alright, well, I'm up to 117 now. And we are drawing only about 0.8 amps. It's less than I would have thought. Which probably is a good indicator that the various B plus 
voltages are not that high, so the set isn't drawing that much current. In other words, the set's being starved of power. Well, that's probably why nothing's working. There also are some bleeder resistors, and there might be like a fusible resistor in the B plus supply. Uh, so just the tube filaments on their own with nothing else going, it would draw 0.6 amps. And we're at not even 0.8. I would think if the, all the B, there's, there's a B minus rail and a B plus and like a B plus plus. I would think if all those were working, this that's going to definitely draw more than an amp. So I'm thinking, and it doesn't surprise me at all that the power supply is not fully functional. Something goofy with the tuner is you can't rotate all the way around. It definitely stops when you get to one extreme or the other. So if you wanted to go from channels 2 to 13, you have to go all the way back around, or all, you know, for 13 to 2 back, all the way around the other way. That's pretty annoying. Uh, oh, am I, am I dreaming? Oh, I'm not dreaming. We do have glowage on the CRT. Oh, that's the vertical oscillator we're hearing. I'm changing vertical hold now. Just like I thought with that one cap being gone, it's not, it's not, one of the vertical deflection plates isn't connected to anything. Well, that's encouraging. So that was, that has got some life, CRT's got some life. Medium to blow up. The current draw has actually dropped a little bit. So if those caps are forming up, it's, I mean, I don't think they are. So I expect the current draw to be slowly. Well, okay, if they're forming up, the leakage current's going to go down, so it'll draw less current. But it also, as the leakage current goes down, the B plus voltage should increase and the rest of the set should draw more current. So overall, I would expect the current draw to be going up slowly if those caps are forming up. All right, well, I think that's about as good as we're going to get. So if that is, this goes clockwise. Let's see, where's that channel plate? It's on the cabinet. Ah. So my channels two, three, four, five, six. So if you have any reception, I expect to hear something here. But you know what? It's not doing anything when I change channels. You should hear it as I change channels, and we should be hearing some kind of snow or hiss. So we're just getting no nothing going through either the RF or the tuner or the IF. Something, something is amiss there. All right, not the most exciting power-up, but it could have been a lot worse. Just going to do this again so you can see what happens when I turn it off in the dark. Kind of peters out and it gets brighter as the vertical collapses. Okay, now what? Oh, we got all kinds of fun stuff to dig through. Let's flip this on its side and take a look underneath the chassis. Here's a quick look over the whole chassis. Plenty of room to work under there. Here's the high voltage stuff. The cap I clipped out would have gone in here. That's going to be some of our sweep circuitry and I think sound uh, was over there. And this is all the RF IF stuff. That's the tuner and the power supply is down in here. Here's a selenium rectifier. It is warm. But under normal operations, they run a bit warm anyways. That's kind of why they have these cooling fins, sort of. Uh, power resistor. That's a little bit warm. This guy is kind of cold. So, good indication to me that there's something not right there. It's a 2 watt resistor and it's not even warm, so there must not be much current flowing through it. I am pretty darn sure these are all the original caps. I oh, see this one is kind of losing its end. This electrolytic has lost its insides. 
So it has this one. Uh, this high voltage cap. It's not warm, but uh, it's <laughs> and bulging out there. The both ends are bulging out of this one. You drag wax that's dripped out. So these these are definitely getting warm. So what happens is, just like the electrolytics, paper caps start getting leaky too. And when they get leaky, that means there's current flowing where there shouldn't be current flowing, so they get warm. And the, the, these are dipped in wax, and the wax will start melting. See, when you see wax dripping and oozing out of the end, it's a good indication that the caps are not very healthy. And every single one of these axial electrolytics has got goo coming out of it. They're all bad. I don't have to bother testing them if you see that crud coming out. The electrolyte has gone bad inside. Every single one of them's got that. So we'll test some of these. I expect the uh, capacitance on them is going to be a bit off. Like this should be 12 microfarad, 475 volts. I'm guessing either it's going to be leaky or open. And the capacitance is going to be <sighs> off. That I believe is a bleeder resistor for the two, one of the tube filament strings and it is toasty. So it's not too bad to recap because I used a lot of ceramic disc caps. I do plan on restuffing these because it is a not very often seen set and it is 100% original. And the caps are cool looking because they're made by the Chicago Condenser Corporation and they are television capacitors. And that's got that neat CCC logo with a little cap symbol in the middle. I started poking around in the power supply a bit and the voltages to some extent weren't as bad as I thought they'd be so uh, let me quickly go over this and confuse the heck out of you all. I did go over this in the uh, earlier video but I'll, I'll do it again because it's worth repeating. This is a weird power supply. We have two well, so here's the AC line coming in. You have two filament strings and a couple of the tubes tied into both strings. That's not too confusing. We do have a couple of dropper resistors. I want to make sure those are in spec. The three tubes in the tuner go off their own little separate power transformer. And it gets weird. We have, well, <laughs> we have two rectifier tubes and a selenium rectifier. 25Z6, we'll start with that. That's used uh, in the backwards direction, so to speak, to make minus 120 volts by rectifying the AC line coming in. The other half forms a voltage doubler in conjunction with the selenium rectifier, which is also just used as a half-wave rectifier to make plus 120. And then the doubler uh, the output goes back around to the left, and that powers our high voltage. And then there's a 6x5 with both diodes in parallel. That makes a tripler. It's all the way up to 350 volts. So that's where I measured it, around 300 or so. Not as bad as I thought it would be. What is bad is this. And you can just tell by looking at the power supply design that that's your main supply. That's got the biggest current load. Why do I say that? Because they have two big filter caps, 120 microfarad, 100 microfarad, and a filter choke. Others just have, say, 30 microfarad, 15 microfarad, 30 microfarad, and they don't have a filter choke. I mean, clearly they want this to be filtered and clean and have plenty of oomph. There, I measure, actually right, right on the rectifier, which should be the highest voltage potential, it starts out at 90, and when the set warms up, it, it nosedives to 70. So I think we've lost a lot of efficiency. And that's what happens with selenium rectifiers over time, is they degrade. They don't, they, their internal resistance goes up. And it was warm when I touched it. They do get somewhat warm in normal operation, but they shouldn't get hot. I think we've got a lot of losses on that selenium rectifier. Now there is one quick and dirty way to work around that, which, what the heck, I've never done it, so we'll give it a try. 
What is the quick and dirty solution? Well, here's our cathode side, here's our anode side, or minus and plus, however you want to think about it. Kind of backwards. When you replace this with a silicon diode, the cathode goes to where the plus sign is. That's where, like, the plus comes out with the rectifier, so to speak. We can just put a silicon diode in parallel with this. That's more efficient, has a lower drop. Most of the power will favor going through the diode and ignore this guy. Just like you can sometimes get away with doing that when you have filter caps that have dried out. Not ones that have shorted or are very leaky, but ones that have gone open. You can just tack a new cap across it. Long term, not, not the best idea because the selenium rectifier is still there and it could go up in smoke uh, at some point. But for a quick test, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab a 1N5408. That's a 3 amp 1000 volt diode. Way superior to what's in there now. And we're just going to tack it in here. Now, you have, I'm sure many of you have heard when, you've add, when you replace a selenium with a silicon diode, you should add a series resistor to emulate, simulate, give it the same characteristics as the old inefficient selenium. Perhaps we'll do that eventually. I'm not going to do it right now. And the question you often see is what value should it be? It depends on the application. What we're going to do is eventually we'll replace this with a silicon diode. When we get the whole set working, we'll measure the voltage here. We know what it should be, or at least downwind when it's been filtered, but it should be, what, 125? If it's higher, we'll experimentally determine what resistor value gets us to that 125 volts. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Right now, let's just tack a diode in. There's my new diode, just tacked in right across the selenium. Like I said, the cathode goes to the plus. I also replaced the high voltage cap that had been clipped out. And while doing so, I made an unfortunate discovery. These are not the original high voltage caps. As much as I like a cool old graphic and television capacitor, Chicago Corp Condenser Corporation, these aren't the originals. They're very old. Whoever replaced these did it ages ago. How do I know they're replaced? Because every one of these caps has J-hooks on the end of it. So uh, they must have failed ages ago. Anyways, let's see what, if any, difference that cap made. So let's see, let's turn this on. It's not the most stable chassis to work on. I'm going to have to, I don't know, rig up some 2x4s or something to brace this. So let's see. Can you guys see that? I hope so. Here, it'll go right here. Okay, before this was like 70 volts at this point. And now it's like 116. It seems pretty stable too. So that's good. But is the set working right? Doesn't really seem so. Kill the lights. Ah. It's hard to even tell what's going on. Let's try some of the CRT controls. I think that's supposed to be focus. <laughs> I think that's a vertical position. Maybe that's horizontal. Boy, I don't know. These controls are not... <laughs> kind of nothing is working the way I would expect it to with these controls. I don't know what the heck is going on. 
That's probably vertical hold because it's making the vertical do freaky things. And this would be horizontal hold, and that's not doing anything. And that's brightness, it's kind of sort of doing something. And that's contrast, I think. Or maybe that's brightness. Maybe this is contrast, that would make more sense. And the tuner does nothing. So, this is one messed up set. This is uh, <laughs> one of the sickest sets I've seen in terms of a set that powers on, but like nothing, nothing's working right. Tuner's not doing anything right. Deflection system, high voltage, I mean like nothing. At least we have a little bit of high voltage, there's a little bit of glow on the CRT face. Whew. Alright, uh, I did also earlier measure ripple on the filter cap on that uh, after that selenium rectifier and it was like 5 volts of ripple which is really high and uh, here I'll, I'll get in closer that is the main filter cap selenium rectifier 18 ohm surge limiting resistor and then main filter cap and it's oozed out some stuff I am going to tack in a replacement on for both of those sections I happen to have some nice shiny new caps here and they're pretty pretty sizable for a vintage set 150 microfarad and 100 microfarad uh, let's see what were the originals the originals are 125 and 100 so all these in a 150 and a 100. I suspect um, these have this cap has dried out or leaked out, and it's not filtering very well. And we're getting a lot of uh, ripple, and that's probably what's causing some of that hum or tick out of the speaker. I'm just going to tack it in place across the old cap. Let's see how that goes. I figured it would be a good idea to take a break from working underneath the chassis to check all the tubes to eliminate them as a possible source of trouble. It was interesting what I discovered. One, uh, several of the tubes are branded MEC. Kind of crudely, just in big old letters M-E-C-K. And Plymouth, Indiana, made in USA. Now, Mac did not make these tubes. There were only a handful of tube makers by the late 40s. RCA, Sylvania, Tungsol, maybe a couple others. So they bought these from somebody and had their name put on them. Also, both the six AL5s have Mac on them. It's kind of hard to read, though. But that's it. The rest do not. There's a, there are a bunch of 6AU6s, and they all say Mirror Tone on them. I've never heard of Mirror Tone. I don't know if that was an obscure TV brand, or a tube reseller. I, I don't know what Mirror Tone is. Uh, but they're old. The date on it is, nine, is a 935. That might mean the 35th week of 1949. And finally, all of the uh, remaining octal tubes, other than that one that has mech on it, they're all RCA. And they're all matched. Like the same production week. Made in USA 926, which probably means the 26th week of 1949. What I'm getting at is, I think there's a very good chance these are all the original tubes. Because they're old and they're all the same. Otherwise, maybe somebody went out of their way to replace all the tubes at once. But if they did it in, the, say, the 50s or the 60s, or even, you know, very recently, maybe somebody tried to restore this set, they just bought a bunch of new old stock tubes, they wouldn't all match. Or it's very unlikely they would all match. 
on the other hand, it looks like the set has a fair number of hours on it. All these tubes test really, really good. Very, <laughs> I'm very puzzled by that. And why are only three of the tubes branded mech if they are all the original tubes? And what is mirror tone? Huh, I don't know. I was hoping to find some bad tubes too because, well, that's not what <laughs> that, well, I can eliminate that as a source of trouble. There was one other little oddity that I found. That's the middle tube and the tuner. That's the mixer tube. According to the service info and the label inside the cabinet, the tube chart, that should be a 6AG5. I found a 6AU6 in there. And it was that same mirror tone. So if those are the original tubes, why did they have a 6AU6 in there? When the tube chart inside the cabinet says 6AG5. They're similar, they're both pentodes, I believe, but there are some characteristics that wouldn't make them that makes them not interchangeable. I think one's remote cutoff and one's sharp cutoff or something like that. They're not exactly drop-in replacements for each other. I'm not saying no signal will get through, but uh, I don't think it's a good valid substitution. So I put a 6AG5 in there. Made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> Okay, so now what? Well, let's get back underneath the chassis. Here are all of my new high voltage caps tacked in place. Uh, and I replaced a few more electrolytics on axial here and here. I figure I'll go after that horrible buzz on the audio next. It's a little confusing to read on the schematic, but because uh, the lines are a little faded. But off of the main B plus, after that 18 ohm resistor next to the selenium rectifier, where it says 200 milliamp, there's a line going down. 250 ohm resistor. That goes off to the right, and where it says plus 120 V audio. There's a 30 microfarad filter cap on that, and if we go over to the audio, we see that goes to the primary of the output transformer. Also there's a 4.7K going to the screen, or is it the suppressor? And there's another 30 microfarad on the other side of that. I do believe that would be this cap for sure, and then either that or that. And just like all the other elect electrolytics in this set, there's goo coming out of it. Well, it was goo, now it's just dried crust. I'm going to try replacing those. I say try because these are axial. And... I have ordered up some replacements. On hand, I only have radial. For this type, where both the leads come out of one end, it might be tough to span. This one probably maybe not too bad, but this guy... Well, I guess I'll, I can attach an extension lead onto it. that guy too. So uh, no, I'm not doing this exactly methodically so much and I'm not, not testing things because I can tell these caps, I know all these caps are bad just by looking at them. <laughs> when the ends are oozing out when you see dried crud that came out of the electrolytics, they're bad. And I'm sure that's causing some of our problems, if not all of our problems. I will get out my cap tester. We'll at least check a couple of these just to confirm that. Uh, let's see, 30 microfarad, 150 volt. I'll, I'll dig up something appropriate. Be nice if they labeled these a little more clearly instead of just having to work positive and like put a band around it or some plus signs or something. Okay, uh, I'll check for leakage first. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it is extremely leaky. If it was a good cap, that light would come on briefly and then fade out as the cap charges up. Or 
if it was reforming, it would gradually dim down. Well, that's not doing anything. Alright, well, let's check for capacitance. Huh, it actually does have some capacitance. And it's actually about 30 microfarads. So it's not completely crap. Boy, it sure is leaky. Here, let's check one of the others. This is a 12 microfarad. Should be get up to 475. Also has that crust on the end. Extremely leaky at just 100 volts. Just for the heck of it, let's try doing one of these high voltage caps. It should be good to 6,000 volts. Let's see if it's leaky with just a few hundred on it. Yeah, <laughs> it's leaky with just 500 volts. No chance of working at 6,000. The rate at which that light flashes is an indicator, visual indicator of how leaky it is. If it's just on solid, it's very leaky. But even flashing, I mean, for the way this cap is used, there should be zero leakage. Electrolytics, you're going to always have at least some leakage in the microamp range, maybe, even for a brand new cap. But paper, plastic film cap should have zero leakage. They're extremely small. It turns out that cap is the filter for the B- minus supply rail. Two new caps here for the audio amp. Let's see if that helped any. Also noticed on the uh, cover page for the SAMs, they do give the current reading and it should be 0.97 amps, let's just call it an amp, at 117 volts. Well, Oh, my buzz is still there. We'll drawing about 0.8 amps. I mean, so the buzz is clearly related to the vertical. Why is it getting into the audio so strongly? So it's vertical hold I'm adjusting. It's horizontal hold. It's contrast. Brightness. So all the controls are kind of doing their thing. It's ooh, horizontal centering, I think. Let's focus. This is vertical centering. If I change channels. Nothing. Hmm. It's a little frustrating that, with the exception of replacing the high voltage caps and adding one diode, nothing has made any difference whatsoever. <laughs> Even though all the parts I took out were really bad. Huh. It's tempting just to blow through and recap it because I know all the caps are really bad. But I would like to see at least some incremental progress. Whew. Hmm. 
Well, let's replace uh, the rest of the filter caps, at least they're easy to get at, like that guy. That is the other cap on the B-. minus. There's a pie filter on the B- minus supply. A 30, 1200 ohm resistor and a 30. We re replaced this one. I have not replaced that one yet. I replaced quite a few of the others though. There's, there's all, there are only two electrolytics in each of those three cans up top, so it's just a total of six. Two have been bypassed already, so there's four more of those and two left down here so we've we've replaced I think more than half the electrolytics already and there aren't a whole lot of paper caps in this set